very, very happy to be here. My name is Mark Curtis. I lead innovation and thought leadership at Accenture Interactive overall. Uh, but I founded Fjord uh, 20 years ago and um, <clears throat> and I've been a, a leader of Fjord and, um, and still am. And one of the things I do every year is to lead Fjord Trends. I'm here with uh, Lanson Warred. Lanson, did I say that correctly? Um, almost. <laughs> almost. OK, you, I'm going to have to have remedial training here. Um, I'm here with Lanson. Um, I'm delighted to be with him. He leads design for uh, Accenture Interactive right the way across um, Benelux and and uh, France as well. Um, so I'm going to take the lead on presenting the trends to you, um, and and I'm going to give time as we go through with Lanson to discuss a bit uh, what this means uh, in Belgium, um, and then at the end we're going to take some time to reflect on this. Uh, in groups. Uh, so we should take about 40 minutes to get through the first section. We're going to talk about uh, four of the seven trends we've written about um, this year. And I'm going to start by talking about how we put these together. So one of the things, well, the, the way in which we, we develop trends, we've been doing this for a long time, this is now our 14th edition of them, <clears throat> is we get uh, input from literally all of our designers all over the world. So think of this as being an exercise in both qualitative and quantitative research, as in it's 2,000 designers now in 35 cities across the world, literally right the way across the world. And we spend quite a lot of time in August, uh, July and August each year, um, gathering data from them about what they believe are the major trends, which are going to define the way in which we think about developing products and services and experiences over the next, say, one to three years. So it's a fairly near-term uh, timescale. If you've come today hoping for a vision of what we're going to be doing in 10 years' time with jetpacks, and, you know, we're not going to talk about that. Um, what, you know, it's fun and interesting, but it's too far out to influence the business decisions that you'll be making tomorrow. And that's really what we're looking at here is the intersection between technology and human and business, and, and what are the contextual things that we need to be thinking about as we look at what happens at that intersection, which is where we create experiences. The, the What we do is every team, every studio that we have uh, selects their favorite trends from the ones that all of their designers have put forward on posters. Actually, that's the medium we use. And then we spend a lot of time in September listening to their presentations and then doing what I call uh, pattern recognition. And the pattern recognition is really where we say, well, what are we seeing here, which is big picture stuff? And how do they cluster together? And what are the ones which are real and we can see evidence for? And what are the ones that we, we don't think are happening? They're just something we might wish for as designers. And what makes it through that cut then becomes our trends for the year. And we've got seven this year. When we've done that, what we also do is step back and do... Um, Again, uh, what I think is uh, pattern recognition is, is looking at the big picture and saying, is there something we're seeing here which, um, which is a meta theme? And this year it was very clear to us as there was. So let's just pause there and talk about this year. Um, you know, this has been the most extraordinary year to try and do trends that I've ever known. Um, and we cannot really talk about them without referencing the pandemic often. Uh, and I know it would be great not to talk about the pandemic for once, but actually that's not realistic because the shadow it's going to cast will be there for some time to come. Because of that, and because what it's done is it's broken some patterns of activity and accelerated others in really dramatic ways, we think that now is the time for us to be saying, right, this, what this does is it gives us a blank sheet of paper. And on that blank sheet, we're going to be redefining what the 21st century is all about. So to put it in a nutshell, we actually think the 21st century started on the 1st of January 2021, this year. And our job with you, our clients, is to rethink the map and redraw the map around the kind of world that we want and the kind of world that is, you know, instead of just letting it emerge, we actually need to be actively designing it and thinking, well, what's going to work better now? And how are we going to make that work? So we see this as very much a year, maybe a two to three years, about mapping out new territory. You will hear that really clearly, especially when we come on to a trend called Sweet Teams are made of this. And in fact, even this morning in the UK, I was listening to the main radio news program, and they were talking about exactly this with the future of work. 
that nobody knows exactly what it's going to look like yet. And now is, a, you know, now is the time to really sort of drive that. So um, that's a sort of overview. Why don't we just kick in and just get straight into the first trend, please? Um, and um, next slide, please. Um, so the first trend is called collective displacement. And, and I, I think this is really a sort of foundational anchor trend this year, because this is all about um, the way in which we have shifted what we do in time and space. That might sound a little bit esoteric. What it means practically is we're doing different things in different places and at different times. And actually, that's that's really, really significant when you begin to analyze it. So there's been a literal shift in place. So we're seeing a huge urban to rural drift taking place. Initially, we thought maybe that was just in Western Europe, but it turns out that's not the case. We heard, for example, from our Johannesburg studio that there's a major urban to rural drift going on in South Africa. Literally just yesterday on the radio, I was hearing this is causing huge problems in India as people are trying to get out of cities and go to the countryside. But the problem they're doing is that they're carrying the pandemic with them as they go back to more rural areas. We see it, for example, in United Arab Emirates, where the population has gone down by something like 20 to 25 percent, because a lot of the guest workers have gone back to the countries that they originally came from. So we see this literal displacement from, uh, from cities to elsewhere, or even between cities as well. You know, I worked with somebody I was on a call with this morning. She's Norwegian. She was working for me in London and had done for three or four years. At the beginning of lockdown, she managed to get out with her boyfriend and get to Portugal. And she's sitting there now, and I'm working perfectly comfortably with her. She's not showing any signs of coming back in the near future. But there's other kinds of dislocation as well. So uh, we see it, for example, in activity. Um, so yoga, birthday party, concerts, those are all taking place in different places. We see it in community. So things like football. Um, I would have loved to have been at Stamford Bridge last night uh, to see Chelsea beat Real Madrid, um, but I'm not allowed to go, and neither are you know, all the other 50,000 fans who might be there. So there's a literal displacement of community, and we have to then run our communities, whether that's football or religion. I know some people think that's the same thing, or school or whatever it is. We're actually doing these in different places. Then we're also seeing a displacement in, and I think this is psychologically immensely important, and we need to reflect on it in our sense of agency. And by that, what we mean is our ability to control our destiny. And that, that actually has really, I think, particularly over the last year, undermined people's confidence. I think confidence is an important word to think about here when you think about consumers and customers, that their confidence in the future is still very low because they've experienced a year when they were unable, A, unable to plan things, you know, I want to go to France for my summer holidays, but I still don't know whether it's worth booking anything or not. And I'm not going to know for, for a little while to come yet. And it's dependent on a number of factors, like what the UK government says, what the EU says, what the French say, etc. So confidence is very difficult to maintain. And, and, and on, on top of that, it's undermined by the fact that we've got, we've got used to, particularly in Western democracies over the last year, is being told by governments and also by our organisations we work for to do different things in different places at different times. So again, you've got that reinforcement of collective displacement going on. What all of this kind of ladders up to, um, and I'm indebted to a, a German colleague who, 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 who first came up with this, is what he called a reversal of the flow of life. And what he meant by that was, our life has typically involved, particularly as adults, she has children as well, getting up and going out. I mean, hunter-gatherers were all about getting up and going out, and that was for tens of thousands of years of evolution. More recently, in a more commercial context, obviously that's been about going out to go shopping or go to work or go to the doctors, go to restaurants, go to the cinema, go to theatres, everything. You know, you, you largely go out to achieve things. Um, of course, some of it happens at home, but not that much. Now, all of that has reversed over the last year, and it's all been stuff that we've had to get used to doing at home. Some of that reversal of the flow isn't going to go back. Now, of course, I'm not arguing we're not going to go back to restaurants as and when we can. I think most sentient human beings that I know are desperate to go back to bars, pubs, restaurants, etc. But at the same time, there's some stuff which is going to remain. I saw a remarkable statistic yesterday in the UK. 
e-commerce and the UK, to be fair, is leading the world, I think, in this. Uh, it's certainly ahead of America, somewhat surprisingly. But e-commerce in the UK is now f- without grocery, if you take grocery out of it, is 50 percent of the addressable market for retail is now happening through e-commerce, i.e. happening digitally. That is an extraordinary tipping point, And we were nowhere near there a year ago when the pandemic began. So that is part of this. And, and, and many people are speculating, including retailers themselves, that although we are going to go back to shops, we won't have the same expectations of shops. We won't go back so much. And we intend to. And we're hearing this very, very clearly from consumers. We intend to maintain some of the new habits that we've we've picked up. Can we go on to the next slide, please? So. This reversal of the flow gives us this visibility issue. The visibility issue is that you are, you know, you are less visible to your customers and your customer is less visible to you because the person you thought you knew has actually changed dramatically over the last year. We will be releasing some research on June 15th, um, which will provide really deep evidence. And I will give you a little snapshot of that now, that consumers have shifted uh, globally that 50% of consumers have used the last year to reevaluate who they are and what their life is about. And that has created a dramatic shift in the way in which they think about what to purchase and what the contextual thinking in their head is around why to purchase. So your customer, and again, we'll show you this evidence very soon, has literally shifted. At the same time, their visibility of you has shifted because their pattern of life is so different. If I'm not getting on the subway or the bus or the tram in the morning to go to work, I'm not seeing all those adverts. I'm not seeing what other people are reading. I'm not seeing other people, full stop. Anything like the volume that you would when you're normally walking around. You're not seeing their hairstyles, their cosmetics, their clothes. No one's actually sure whether anybody actually wears trousers anymore because we never see them on Teams or Zoom. You know, all of that has changed. So what that means is customers' ability to collect data about things about which they then make experiential or commercial decisions have changed dramatically and they're doing almost all of it online rather than if you like in real life what that means is we really need to adapt to more hybrid experiences and i'm just going to leave you with one which i think is a really symbolic of where we think we're going to go which is what the london marathon is doing so the london marathon this year have shifted the race date from spring to autumn for obvious pandemic reasons what they're now planning, and they've, they've openly, they've, they've set this as a target, is 50,000 runners on the ground in London in October. So fingers crossed that will happen. But another 50,000 appearing virtually and running the race virtually using, you know, RunKeeper or Strava or any one of the other fitness apps. And that, that would make a 100,000 total collective race, which would be the largest marathon, I think I'm right in saying, ever run in history, the largest single mass participation event. Absolutely amazing and a really interesting way in which they've grasped what the future looks like, which is this hybrid place where some of the reversal of the some of the flow is reversed back to where it was. But a lot of our habits have actually permanently shifted and they've grasped that. So I'll pause there. Um, Lanson, are you seeing reflections or echoes of this in in Belgium and in your market? Well, yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, uh, like you said, the signals were here very visible i think um so what we saw here um certainly in the beginning of the pandemic um i think it was very tough uh, and what we saw that like you saw it even on the real estate market then uh, literally people looking for places moving out of cities looking for apartments with terraces or at least uh, houses with gardens and so on uh, and it's funny now we're almost a year later and i remember i think it was last month also that the, the numbers showed basically that uh, the vacation homes in the Ardennes, which is the southern part of uh, Belgium, like now the market went up, like prices went up on average like 12%, all wow. language speaking people moving over there. So it's a, it's, it's, it's an amazing shift that was, uh, that's really a clear signal literally that this is happening almost physically. Um, but on many, on, on many domains, right? So I, I remember also in the beginning when schools, schools were closing here in Belgium, Again, it had a, a huge impact, and, and we'll get onto that also when we talk about uh, the sweet teams trend. Um, 
But that was the, the shift there. It took us by su such a big surprise, basically. And, and actually, looking back, it was quite amazing that uh, what, what teachers and so on achieved uh, and like the, the digital platforms that we had in place, uh, how they were able to shift into a digital way of, of teaching. Uh, that was great to see. Um, but on top of that, it was like scrambling around. And what we see is like uh, it was in France and Germany also that even there was uh, this school TV concepts that came up also instead of just relying on, on teachers alone. A lot of content was also distributed that way. And it's funny because it's I remember it from when I was young. Uh, it was a concept like school TV that you had at home. Um, but this is basically coming back and it's it's on one hand great to see uh, the creativity on on, uh, on those applications. Um, but there's other stuff, right? I, I know one of the biggest areas that were impacted also was culture, um, like the, the, not only events, but also theater, music, everything. Um, it's still a huge issue, issue, by the way. But you see that, um, and, and I think it comes back in a lot of these trends. We are in a, in a like a gray area and a transition transition period, if you can, if I can say it like that, um, where we're trying to figure out what to do here. And there's a few great examples. One is in, uh, there was a, a theater group called Skagen, which uh, um, basically created a new piece, new play, uh, but they did it completely on, on through their own app uh, and WhatsApp. And what you were able to do is basically uh, be part of a family. Uh, you know, it's a story about a family and, and their daughter. You could have, actually participate in the family discussions. Uh, and the play went on for three weeks uh, and it was just like live happening with you there. So these kind of concepts show um, a tremendous creativity also around that. Um, and it's, it gives an answer to some extent to, uh, to the needs of these, uh, of these people, right? Um, and another one is, uh, you mentioned football. It's, it's the same one here. I think it's one of the biggest, uh, you know, the Belgian team is quite known. Yeah. <laughs> huge, huge audience, audiences. Uh, and they're also like, the, the, they, they also went virtually. And it's, it's, there was a, you know, one concept, the FanFest app that they released also, which was also cool to see in, in how to, um, you know, uh, not only have the matches also that you can follow them, but also capture like the cheers. You could really uh, uh, cheer through the app and it was played in the, in the stadium so that you get some kind of a, of a connection there. It's not replacing what we had. So, but it's definitely showing that we're all looking for ways in how we can replicate at least uh, and maintain in this, situa in this situation. Um, so yeah, I think definitely here locally also, and it's still going on strong. I think we're all looking forward now that it'll go back to normal. But as you yeah. said, I think we will come into some sort of hybrid way um, of, of coping with, uh, with the situation in the end, so. Interesting, really interesting. And I'd forgotten, of course, you do have the best football team in the world right now. <laughs> well, most of them play in England, right? <laughs> um, so I'm going to move on to the next slide, please. And we'll, we'll go into the next trend, which is sweet teams are made of this. And I did hint at this a moment or two ago. Um, this is about really the future of work. And um, the big story here is about the reciprocity between employer and employee. And we think that when we think about the future of work, this is one of the major things to focus on because our reciprocity has shifted so dramatically over the last year. Next slide, please. So let's think about that reciprocity. First of all, um, you know, a lot of what you, I think some people might have called the peripheral value of work, though I'm beginning to think it's not peripheral at all. I think it's core value of work, which is simply the value you get, out, the energy you get out of meeting other people. That's disappeared. And, and we've seen that shift. Um, at the same time, a lot of the costs associated by the by, uh, with employment have shifted, in some cases, quite invisibly to the employee. So my my chair, my desk, the broadband I'm using, you know, that a lot of that, the heating that I'm still even in early May because it's so cold still, uh, that I'm having to use in the UK to keep me warm, that's all shifted to me, and this has been the case right the way across the board. So you're seeing this shift in the give and take between worker and work between and particularly in value as well. You know, that young worker is, you know, who's 23 and is a graduate. She's not making the connections with older people, which are teaching her some of the skills to do with work, being in a workspace or being in a highly performing team because she's not actually picking up on a lot of those cues live. 
she's not meeting with a lot of her peers of roughly the same age who might be really important to her career in her 30s, 40s and 50s. So those foundational elements, particularly if you're at the younger, newer entrant end of the market of reciprocity, have really shifted on a huge axis. And indeed, of course, the nature of work when you're working at home is very different because you have often family or, you know, dogs. I'm sure we've all lost count at the number of calls we've had where cats have walked past the screen or dogs have appeared. And it's charming. And in many ways, it's good. But what we're seeing is uh, attention emerging or, if, if you like, almost a schizophrenia and how people are responding to this a year into it while we're looking at the future of what's work going to look like. And the first one is within employees. So the tension within employees, on the one hand, you've got people saying, I'm really desperate to go back to work. Um, and, and I think almost everybody I know is saying that, that they want to be in a space with other people so they can get back some of that, what I called earlier, peripheral value of work, that invisible value of being an energy with other people. But at the same time, what they're saying is, uh, but I think I'm going to work more from home or more remotely. That's probably a better way of putting it because a remote may not necessarily be home. It could be your holiday home in the Ardennes, for example. And a lot of people have tweaked that as well. Um, so we may see people having extended summer breaks where they work from their break with their family, but actually, you know, aren't back in the city that they originally based in for maybe a couple of months. As we see that, so, so that tension between people saying, I want to go back, but on the other hand, I don't want to go back. We're seeing that play out. And by the way, the numbers are coming out really clearly now. Okay, I say clearly, it's quite a broad band, but somewhere between 30 to 50% of time is what people are estimating they're going to spend working remotely. I'll come back to that because it's very important. So the second thing is attention within employers. So you have people like Reed Hastings at Netflix who unsurprisingly is saying, what's the quote? Um, it's a pure negative. My team's not being able to get together to be creative. On the other hand, you've got every CFO and COO in the world looking at this understandably as a, you know, almost as a once in a lifetime opportunity to change the asset base of a company in, you know, massively financially in its favor. And they're going to take that opportunity. Um, then the third place where there is no tension or the third vector is government. And increasingly, we're seeing pressure from government for businesses to have their people back in offices in city centers. So that is because what they're worried about is the hollowing out of office areas and city centers. If people are only working maybe 70 to 50 percent of their time there. And that number is important because that if it's, let's say, at the lower end, it's 30 percent of time not in the office. That's probably the profit margin of the local pharmacy or the local restaurant or the dry cleaning company. All of those uh, infrastructure companies around office locations that actually almost metaphorically and literally prop up the office building. But it's also all the mass transit workers that get you there. It's the hotels that service people, it's the travel. So the knock-on effects, people think when we talk about this initially, we're talking about office workers, we're not. The radial effects of office workers shifting how they work this dramatically are going to be felt for a long time. Next slide, please. So this is very important, this how does this work and how does this new age work? And to put it, you know, quickly, we're entering an era of prototyping what the future of work is. And I think that's a very important word to use here is nobody knows for sure where this is going to go. And every company is going to have to prototype it. We can't. There's no option to go. Well, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to wait and watch what others do, because actually your employees and, you know, government and others are going to be saying, well, how are you going to run this? And, and of course, all companies that we know are actually tackling this now. Four things to think about as we tackle this reciprocity issue. The first is technology. So the software hardware combination we're using at the moment is still pretty rough. In fact, you know, I'm using a hack together system with a Logitech camera and a Jabra speaker here and my laptop here. The laptop actually gives away the whole game, the name. It was made for the lap or for moving around. It wasn't made to be sitting still at or for, you know, working nine hours a day from. So we're actually working with imperfect tools and we expect to see what I would call an iPod moment over the next two to three years as somebody somewhere, could be Apple, could be Google, could be Microsoft, comes to market with a better hardware, software and environment um, <clears throat> combination, which, which really facilitates 
a completely revolutionary way of remote working and makes it a lot better. The second is culture, and everybody is talking about this. This is how do we create a sense of belonging when we're working in a hybrid world as opposed to working face to face? So mankind, I talked about hunters gatherers about 20 minutes ago. Um, so mankind have, you know, always been very good in varying ways at developing culture, but we've always been doing it face to face. You know, cultures have developed when people have been together. We don't know how to develop cultures at distance or at a mix of distance and close. So how do we build culture is, I think, going to be a critical question. Well, in fact, we know CEOs are really asking themselves that question already and chief HR officers as well. Then you have this question about talent, which is on the one hand, you've got talent saying, this is great, I can work from anywhere. But on the other hand, and many of them intend to do so, like the chap in the photograph here with the laptop looking out over some amazing view. But at the same time, you've got organizations going, well, this is great, we can employ from anywhere. And that might do wonders for our inclusion and diversity. But it also might mean that we might pay people less if they're going to be working from their holiday home in the Ardennes rather than actually being in Brussels. Um, and that's happening in Silicon Valley right now, that a furious debate is breaking out a bit. So as we get to this end of what I'm talking about here, we're edging into ethics. And clearly, the future of work is going to drive out a lot of questions around ethics. That relates to the reciprocity word that I used already. And the last one on ethics is how do we control people when they're working more from home? It's much easier to control people. And we, 20th century was all about control in factories and then control in office environment. But now that we're dispersed in remote environments, how do we actually control that? How do we control when people are in and when they're out? How do we manage the algorithm that says that, you know, if Lanson is working Mondays, Fridays at home and I'm working Tuesdays, Wednesdays, that only gives us Wednesday, uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, that only gives us Wednesday to get together. And then if another one of our colleagues, you know, isn't there on Wednesdays, we can't get that meeting. But even more, how do we control people remotely? And there are software and hardware combinations like Staff Cop and Sneak emerging to monitor home working. But that, again, really brings us into this big ethical area of who controls my house. To put a simple reason, you know, idea on it, I'm using a Google Mesh network of my broadband here. Is that now part of Accenture's network? Should our CEO be saying, look, part of your home is something that we should control and we should insist on levels of security and passwords? That then again, we'll come back to the psychology word, is sort of deep shift in psychology about our relationship between us and organizations. So new world, uh, prototyping, we think a hybrid environment Lanson, what's that like in, in Belgium? Yeah. So I think, think this is one of the, maybe even the, the, the trend we're most familiar with almost. Um, so it's, it's, it's directly affecting our day to day. Um, I think in Belgium, it's, it start the, the big, uh, I think one of the first ones to, to really speak out was, uh, here, I think it was September last year, uh, was Proximus, which is, uh, still our biggest telco, uh, who basically said, and they own, you know, one of the biggest uh, uh, office towers in the center of Brussels. Uh, they basically said, we're not going back. So we will be um, moving, reducing, uh, using less space. And that had quite an impact. So not 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 shortly after, there was uh, Tenet doing the same thing. AXA here also taking a stand, really uh, making that decision, which brought the narrative and got a lot of thinking going uh, because otherwise we're still kind of we'll see where this goes. So that really, I think, uh, made a dent in, in the in the discussions um, and it opened a lot of discussion. It was not only about uh, the, the proximus itself and how to organize themselves, but like you say, the, the pharmacies, everything else, this this huge building, uh, the city of Brussels now looking into what are we going to do with this? this? This will probably become a solution where we need to put in apartments or I don't know what. So it's it opens up a ton, a ton of questions, and it's it's a huge, it's a huge uh, problem to be solved, basically, uh, which is exciting on one end, but uh, but also a bit scary uh, on the other. Um, and it's also interesting to see, like you said, coming into the the prototyping piece, you see a lot of stuff, and I think it's it's really interesting to see uh, a lot of tech tech smaller tech players are also so experimenting with this, of course, maybe maybe more than than the bigger ones. Um, but you see like like uh, concepts with Spotify, for instance, who are working with um, uh, they're talking about a distributed office as a concept. Like it's basically everywhere. Like you said, it's, uh, it could be your living room, whatever. But this will become part of their office. 
Uh, and they're talking about people can choose between an office mix or a home mix, and they will provide a setup uh, and the software based on what you choose for. Um, but it's an, uh, and I think that's the important piece. It will be up to the employee to decide uh, on those. There's another very interesting one, and I, I invite everyone to have a look on there. Dropbox also has been working on a, uh, a playbook. Uh, they have also chosen like a virtual first uh, principle, basically, in everything they will be doing. Uh, which I find very interesting. And they're looking at these playbooks, giving people ways to how will we organize? How, what questions do we need to answer? What do we need to put in place? Um, but it's great to see these kind of yeah, tools and toolkits help shape that thinking. Uh, and I think that will be really important and crucial to help crack that nut because in the end, it will start with the employees and understanding what they want to do in the end. Um, and that's a difficult one. Uh, I think, well, it's, it's for us, it's logical to start there, um, but it's good to see that quite a few organizations are also starting with that, uh, which I think makes sense. And then maybe one thing I, I, and I also experience it from practice, like what you said with the new joiners, younger employees, uh, from my experience, they suffer the most, if I can say, from the situation. Um, um, and it's, it's good to see, well, the, the, the thing is, it's, it has to do with what you said, not being able to, to network enough, you know, making sure your, your career takes off and so on. That's, that's a, big, a big issue. Uh, but it's also like the, the lines are getting blurred. Like uh, I, I hear also, not only from our teams, but from a lot of clients also, that a lot of people, there's basically one big day, everything is blurred. Uh, you're, you're basically working all day long uh, and, and everything is, gets mixed up. And it creates a sense of um, overwhelm, something like it. There seems to be a never-ending way on uh, on working, yes. and that yes. will be a, a big challenge to overcome. I think that uh, maybe it could be a technical solution. You know, we, we're in teams all day, uh, so that it could be there. Uh, but it will probably also have to do in this combination how we will organize work and family in the, moving forward. And there was maybe one to, to close here. It was a great idea, I think, from um, H&M, also specifically on these younger workers. Like they, they put up a service, um, they will rent out suits for free uh, just to boost confidence and just you, you can walk into a store, you, you can entitle to it, you can use it, bring it back, and they will basically either recycle it or give it to charity. So it's a, it's a really nice example on how, how you know, brands can do really meaningful stuff with these uh, with these kind of things. Um, but it's good to see, you know, lots of lots of pieces are moving, and I I, I think it's very exciting in one end to see where this is going. Um, I like I like good. that last example in particular um, from H and M because it it points to the fact again that there are radial effects which have commercial and customer implications for all sorts of organizations beyond what we do with our employees. In other words. You know, you talked about effectively an employee-centered focus um, as being very important. I don't think you're right, but that it has implications for customers as well. Okay, we better move on. Um, next slide, please. Um, our third trend we're going to focus on today is liquid infrastructure. So this is really the mirror image of what we talked about with collective displacement. Next slide, please. Because if uh, what people are doing is shifted in time and space, then how we get things to people and how we organize around the delivery of products and services, no matter how, has to shift dramatically. There's a reason why shops exist, which is that they provide a, um, shops are basically a very efficient place. They're efficient insofar as they provide a sort of um, uh, open warehouse where people can, where goods can be stored temporarily and people can come and collect and pay for them and take them away. So the customer is bearing the cost of um, the, the transportation a lot of the time here, except obviously getting it to the shop. But once it's in the shop, they're then taking it away. It's also very effective for the customer because they only go to one place and they can get products there. And obviously they might go to several places, but mentally they can arrange themselves around that. But the whole idea of shops obviously has been dramatically challenged by the last year. And I'll just reference you back to the e-commerce you know, stats that I was seeing out of the UK, which we're seeing you know, not just in the UK, but obviously in many other places as well. And, and when you don't have or when experiences shift from shops where you may have carefully curated experiences, I'm reminded of, you know, before the lockdown happened in the UK back in late um, September last year, 
my daughter had um, her first baby and I went to see her a couple of days afterwards, you know, to see the baby and say, well done. And I went into a, um, a cosmetics um, makeup um, skincare retailer called Space NK. And I had, a, obviously, I had an amazingly curated experience where somebody could point me at the right things to give skin care to my daughter who just had a baby. And then it was all wrapped up in tissue paper and put in a bag with a ribbon on top. Now, when I order from Space NK online, the cardboard box gets thrown over the fence at me. And if I'm unlucky, my dogs get to open the cardboard box before I do. Um, that's a very different experience. And what we're seeing then is because of that, because our focal point of transaction and experience has shifted so dramatically. So what we're seeing is people focusing on, well, how do we actually create a better experience? The difficulty here, of course, is the balance between better experience and cost to serve. When you go online, we know that cost to serve tends to go up, and that's usually because of returns. The irony, of course, here is that cost to serve has also gone up in the retail environment as well. So if, for example, you're Sephora, what you're now doing is you're making people hand wash when they come in and use sanitizer. You've rearranged your store so that people can be socially distanced, et cetera, et cetera. So, both, so cost to serve has gone up for all sorts of organizations. But at the same time, people, when they're from home, are saying, actually, we want you to, we want you to deliver us a better experience. And there's going to be a huge amount of differentiation in this space as we balance those trade-offs between experience and cost and we design the last six to 10 feet of the experience. So next slide, please. I'm sorry, you can now probably hear my dog. Um, the, um, so where this is going is a, a rise of people, all sorts of organizations really using the pandemic as a reason to um, really rethink not just their supply chain, but actually how all of their physical assets are used and particularly focusing on how to use their assets to supply delight to the customer. So that might be literally what you do with uh, retail outlets. So Barclays Bank in the UK is now saying they're now, they think well on track to most of their high street banks turning into places where um, they house call centers and investment bankers, for example. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing the rise of dark stores and dark restaurants as uh, retailers and, and, and hospitality are realizing the benefits of getting together in a sharing in a B2B sharing economy and uh, pooling their resources in order to drive greater efficiency for them, but also serve the market with, with better quality. And so you're seeing some very radical shifts taking place in the way in which we organize ourselves around this collective displacement that I talked about earlier and how you deliver delight to customers over the last 10 feet is the next barrier where we're going to see a lot more innovation over the next few years. One really interesting example here is a way in which we're seeing uh, roll-ups taking place of um, Amazon, uh, Amazon marketplace suppliers. So there's now a new breed of effectively private equity funded companies who are rolling up the best performers in Amazon marketplace, both in Europe and the US, in order to drive out synergies between them, in order to deliver better customer, better customer value and better customer experience. So big changes of food because of the collective displacement. We need to look at how we deliver delight. One last thing to say on this before I hand back uh, to Lanson is um, sustainability, of course, is coming up. I think even when we wrote this back in December, sustainability is now coming up the outside lane very, very fast here as a key driver of how supply chains organize themselves. And, and, and I think we've even been surprised by the volume of noise around sustainability this year. It may be because of COP26 taking place in Glasgow later the year. It may be because of Biden's presidency has shifted the whole Trump narrative around sustainability. Whatever it is, it's that plus customer delight are going to be the twin things that you really need to think about when you think about designing your supply chain and use of your assets over the next few years. Lance, and back to you, and we, we might want to be quite tight, yeah. a little tight on time. So, so very quickly, what I, what I, I think the trend was also so, uh, evident here in Belgium. Uh, I think a few examples here um, I thought were quite interesting. I rem also, it was uh, beginning of the pandemic last year when the bigger shops had to close. There was also Decathlon, for instance, who had to close, like uh, the, the big shops. Um, 
And it was good to see, um, like very quickly, uh, I think it was May already then, um, that they, they joined forces with Deleuze, for instance, uh, but also with Carrefour. Uh, and you saw them, and, and it's it's very interesting to see, you saw these the, the, the displays of Decathlon coming into Deleuze and, and Carrefour because they could still be open. Um, and it's interesting because it's still the case. So it's the, the starting point of a collaboration there. And it makes a lot of sense because they are quite complementary if you think about it, like uh, selling some footballs or, or a smaller sport gear. Uh, it, it absolutely makes sense. And it, it was a big success. So, uh, and they're still working on it. And because I remember the displays were quite basic, but it shows again, also the prototyping um, mindset a bit that uh, that's going on with these deals. Uh, but that was a very interesting one, I think. Uh, another one was Carrefour also, um, because as you said, e-commerce boomed and Carrefour also had, uh, was like they, they do home delivery, but not a lot. Um, and they're not the best at it also, but they partnered with Deliveroo, for instance, on that, uh, to deliver home groceries with that. But the, the, the speed at which this was set up is, is quite spectacular to see, to be honest, for these kind of bigger players, which I find, find interesting. And then maybe one, one last example is uh, Accor, the, the hotel chain. Yeah. There also, uh, again, it was an area that basically completely fell through. Um, and they started uh, renting rooms with more like, like uh, uh, remote working places. So, which I found was very smart. Like, again, what we just discussed, working at home could be quite tedious and difficult. So, these are very smart, simple, simple solutions uh, always to look at. Um, but again, a great example for me in, in that this trend is uh, is definitely something that's happening uh, with a lot of our clients and others too. Yes. So. I like the example of the Accor thing about a complete rethink about what a physical asset like a hotel is and what it can be. And for a while, they were hospitals. So you know, that <laughs> told us a thing. Okay, next slide, please. And last trend. Um, so this last trend is called Rituals, Lost and Found. And I think the name really gives it away. So you probably can think ahead and guess where we're going with this. And, and it's also pretty simple, but it's important. If collective displacement is true, and it is, then one of the things that we've lost, which has been very little commented on, is the rituals that make up the, the fabric of our life. So I probably don't need to point out, but rituals are actually enormously important and enormously human thing because they do form this framework. And they come with strong sentimental values associated with them. They're deeply human. They help us deal with loss. There's been plenty of that over the last year. They help us deal with routine, actually. Um, they help us establish sentiment for things as well. We have a lot of sentiment around rituals. They can be, let's be clear, they can be pretty small. That daily flat white coffee that I used to get just as I was arriving at the office every day was a ritual. It marked a transition point between not work and work, but a little treat for myself. But they can be really big, like a wedding. Um, and, you know, my second daughter, we've been trying to plan a wedding and she wants to get married in Spain. And not surprisingly, we can't plan that wedding right now and haven't been able to for a year now. Um, so we're talking about disruption, both in big and small. We've seen a huge rise in spirituality over the last year. So mindfulness app, calm now even has a premium membership tier for it on American Express. Who would have, who would have seen that coming? Um, we're also seeing the rise of a great deal of concern and, and nap conversation around mental health, unsurprisingly, given what's happened over the last year, and a much greater focus on that ever before. And that, we think, is tightly tied in as well to the way in which we've had to rethink a lot of what our lives are about. And part of that has been the loss of rituals and the loss of control and sense of control because we can't be able to carry out those rituals like we could before. So next slide, please. We think there is huge opportunity space here in helping people establish new rituals or helping them find old rituals that used to be important to them. And, and we've identified four different kinds of rituals. I talked about the first one is the portal ritual. So that is the transition point between one status and another. I talked about that with my daily coffee, but beauty <clears throat> is a really good example of a sector who trade in transition rituals. That taking off beauty at night marks a transition point for so many women or putting it on in the morning or during the day. So it turns out that a whole industry 
is deeply connected to a ritual which is important. Then there's ritual as belonging. So that's the Friday night drinks you have with your mates from work, or it might be Saturday sports. Uh, and Lawson pu pushed earlier at this point, in fact, we have a picture of it, of the way in which some companies have stepped in and, and been able to broadcast the noise of fans at home live into stadiums. Um, and indeed, we saw really early on, I think it was a German club, I can't remember which one it was now, who very enterprisingly gave their fans the ability to create cardboard cutouts of themselves so they could be represented in the stadium. I mean, it's small, but it's actually a beautiful idea. And, and what they were doing was they were trying to help fans manage that ritual shift. Then the third one is rituals as comfort. So this is very, very uh, relevant to wellness, for example. I have a, uh, an exercise bike, which I got um, late in November to try and manage my way through feeling reasonably sane during the winter months. And I've been on it this morning. And that daily ride that I have on the exercise bike has become a massive ritual for me. I mean, I've spent, and ritual, you know, this, this particular bike was not cheap. So I spent actually quite a lot of money on what is effectively a ritual opportunity um, as far as the sellers of that bike are concerned, at least if they define it like that. And then you lastly, you have ritual as anchor. So that's Christmas or for other cultures, Diwali or Eid, the big things in life, the moments in life. Easter is a good example, which, which, which actually anchor uh, communities and people. So we see big opportunities here. A good example, Mars Confectionery understood this with Halloween. So Halloween basically got zapped last year in the US. You, I'm sure you all know it's a massive US uh, ritual every year. And they stepped in and created a series of digital packs in order to enable people to celebrate Halloween with as much fun as they could think of within their home environment, given that going out and knocking from door to door wasn't going to take place. So... We see huge opportunity with rituals and we think that, you know, a focus on this over the next year will increasingly give customers the hope that we think they need. And I'm, I'm going to end before handing back to Lanson on be in the business of hope because confidence is low. I mentioned that at the beginning. Yes, of course, confidence will go up as vaccine uh, vaccines come in, but that's confidence in a certain thing like can I go out? Overall, our confidence as consumers has taken a big knock. And we're now looking for more types of confidence. Being in the business of hope is going to be the best place to be over the next one to three years as we try to rebuild uh, our view on the 21st century. London, Rituals and, and, and Belgium. <laughs> well, I, this is probably one of my favorites uh, of the trends this year. Um, they're quite universal. So it's to put it on, on me, Belgium is a bit... Um, Small, so it's, it's quite, I, I think it ties back what, what I was explaining earlier, like these days have become this one, one, like one big blur almost from uh, lots of stuff going on. So, and I think the rituals show that this, how important they are. Um, a lot of people struggle and I think it's it's because of the loss of, of a couple of these things. So it's, it's great to call them out like that in a trend. Um, but but like you say, you were mentioning the, the some of the retailers. I remember here in Belgium, and it was also a very good example. Like Christmas is a big big thing, as it is in a, uh, in England, in, a, in the UK also. Uh, I remember the like usually only the, the Christmas decorations only go on sale uh, usually after uh, what we call Santa Claus. Uh, that's basically like the, the it's the beginning of September. Um, but last year it was much earlier, uh, and it was just because you know people have, a, have a, a hunger for these kind of, uh, you know, it, it's something they know, they can cling on to, you're at home, uh, it gives warmth and then so on and good, good uh, you know, good memories. Uh, so, so retail started earlier with doing that and even after Christmas, when all the lights were up, a lot of cities also just kept them on. Usually they, they, they go off by like mid jam or something. Uh, here, I think some, some let them uh, just be in the streets for up the end of February just to show that people cling on to these kind of uh, kind of symbols almost, um, which was really nice to see. Um, I, I mentioned football. Um, there's there's another one I think we were also involved in, which is also a very nice one. I think it was called Memorial Day. It's uh, basically here in Belgium, we have, uh, uh, yeah, we remember the, the Second World War. It's uh, And it's an organization, there's an organization um, America and Belgium comes together each year normally with, you know, the parade and everything else. Of course, this wasn't possible. 
So we virtualized everything. Uh, and what you see is there also, even in the virtual form, um, people, it's, it's of course not the same, but it was hugely important. These are a lot of elderly, also a lot of families uh, who each year look at this moment um, and like not doing it was simply not an option. Um, and there was so much support after that. The feedback we got was really, also sometimes emotional. But these are really, really crucial things that people cannot just let go. You cannot just erase, erase those. And maybe maybe to, to, to finalize also, I think one of the, you mentioned these personal moments sometimes, you need them. You need a bit of me time, basically, it's, it's important. Um, and the, the, I think there was a great concept from uh, L'Oreal also. Um, and, and I mean, it's, it's a bit more technical, this one, uh, but it ties in directly into the need of these kind of moments. So what they came up with is um, basically, usually you would go to a shop and, and uh, get some lipstick and, and um, makeup going, like you said. Uh, now this is gone, they've created actually a, a device and it looks quite, it looks beautiful, where you could do really personal by yourself together with an app. Uh, it uses some uh, um, artificial intelligence to scan your face and your skin tones, and then you can start uh, finding out what the best color match for yourself would be. And the device basically generates lipstick paste based on the mix that fits best with your with your, uh, with your your face, which is amazing technically. But the way it ties together, the way it looks, it's like a, almost a little ceremony. Um, it's amazing to look at. Again, it's, uh, I invite you to have, a, have to check it out, but it shows the importance of, of these kind of moments uh, because it's people are struggling with it. It's, it's clear um, uh, and it's great to see these kind of initiatives. I like um, the phrase little ceremony, um, yeah. you know, unboxing, if you think about it, it's been around for years. Yeah. But unboxing is a kind of little ceremony and the better companies have really paid a lot of attention to that. Yeah. Cool. I think we're, we're, we've had for four of our trends, so we can go to the next slide. Um, I want to thank you, Mark, for taking us through this. Um, I Again, every year I'm always amazed by, by the trends we, we can generate. And it's great to see also that we now we were part of this from, from even from Belgium also. Uh, and it's great to see how universal in the end these, these trends are. Um, so what I, as we said, we have still um, uh, uh, some time after the session now in each groups that will be delighted to hear your take on uh, what we'll be sharing with you um, and see uh, if it resonated with you. Also, we've only shown you four trends. There are seven of them. So there's quite a few things that we're still happy to share. So feel free to, to reach out uh, if you would like a, a bigger deep dive on this. Um, the material is ready for you also uh, for download. We will send an email also after this one um, to give you easy access to it. Um, but we hope you enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I'd like to see you in the, the breakout rooms after this session. So thanks a lot.